If everybody will take their seats, we'll get started. I'm pleased to welcome you to this year's Shoemaker Lecture from the Planetary Sciences section of the AGU. And uh, uh, as everybody knows, the talk will be given by Sue Kiefer on, on Enceladus, Oasis, or Iceball. In thinking about the, the legacy of Gene Shoemaker and, and how I should introduce Sue, I wanted to hark back to uh, what people see as one of Gene's real strengths. And in fact, Sue was the one who expressed this to me about 10 or 15 years ago, sitting, sitting in a bar somewhere, that, that Gene was probably the most intellectually honest scientist that either one of us had ever seen. Uh, he followed the science and uh, didn't worry about the rest of it. Uh, I think that, that Sue has followed in those footsteps and has followed the science and the, uh, uh, the combination of measurements, theory, analysis that really brings it all together. Sue, if you would come up here, I have a certificate to present to you. Uh, this is a certificate of recognition from the Planetary Sciences section. Uh, uh, the section recognizes Susan W. Kiefer, the, the 2009 Shoemaker Lecturer for Enceladus, Oasis, or Iceball. So thank you, sir. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm actually going to get back to Gene Shoemaker at the very end of my talk. Um, but I'm going to start with uh, reading a, a little exercise I found in a book that was uh, summarizing philosophy problems. And the book's called Phil Philosophical Papers, Mind, Language, and Reality. And I thought this audience might appreciate this, which is actually a philosophy exercise, but I'm not going to go into that. NASA discovered a planet that it had dubbed Twin Earth. The newly discovered planet was not just roughly the same size as ours, it had a similar climate, and life had evolved there almost identically. Twin Earth contained cats, frying pans, burritos, televisions, baseball, beer, and, at least it, it had seemed, water. It certainly had a clear liquid which fell from the sky, filled rivers and oceans, and quenched the thirst of the indigenous humanoids and astronauts from Earth. When this liquid was analyzed, though, it turned out not to be H2O, but a very complex substance which NASA dubbed H2NO. NASA therefore announced that its previous claim that water had been found on Twin Earth was wrong. Some people said that if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. In this case, the billed bird waddled and quacked, but scientific analysis showed that it wasn't a duck after all. The tabloid newspaper headlines, however, offered a different interpretation. It's water, just not water as we know it. So, loosely speaking, this story can be applied to the plume that erupts from the South Pole of Enceladus. Um, where'd they go? Most mo pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the keyboard takes up a little space here. Most models to date, including the liquid water models, assume that the plume coming from an Enceladus is a, an H2O plume. But it's not an H2O plume. It's only 90% H2O plume. And I hope to convince you that the other 10% is not only important, but perhaps dominant in determining not only the plume characteristics, but the nature of the reservoir. And so loosely, the plume from Enceladus could be called an H2NO plume. Um, there are four types of salient observations, orbital parameters, the nature of the plumes and E-ring, thermal observations, and the surface geology and implied tectonics. Enceladus is tiny about 500 kilometers in diameter. It would fit neatly between San Francisco and Los Angeles. The bulk density is 1,600 kilograms per cubic meter, which is generally thought to imply that it is differentiated with a rocky core of about 150 to 170 kilometer radius. This leaves 80 to 100 kilometers for an icy crust. The spectacular plume that erupts from the South Pole of Enceladus consists of a number of individual jets embedded in a much bigger, fainter plume towering nearly 500 kilometers over the South Polar region. Some particles reach escape velocity about 240 meters a second to feed particles into the E-ring of Saturn. 
It's estimated that only about 1% of the particles that come out of the surface vents escape into the E-ring. The mean vertical velocity of ice particles is about 60 meters a second, much lower than the escape velocity. The fallback of plume ejecta leads to high rates of resurfacing and a lack of impact craters in the polar terrain. Vapor velocities are about 10 times higher than particle velocities, reaching as high as 600 meters a second. The plume particle and vapor fluxes vary on time scales of minutes to tens of minutes, and both are of the order of a few hundred kilograms per second. I've put two pictures of Old Faithful Geyser, which was my field home from 1970s onward, on the right side of this slide. The top one shows the plume at about peak discharge, and the bottom one shows the narrowest choke point in the conduit of Old Faithful, which we got, Jim Westfall and I got with a uh, tiny video camera that we put into the throat of Old Faithful. At peak discharge, Old Faithful ejects more than 100 kilograms a second of liquid water in the form of droplets propelled by the water vapor and exalved gases, which comprise only about 4% of the erupting mass. If Old Faithful were erupting on Enceladus, it would be producing, uh, oh, I forgot to give the dimensions. Um, that vent is about four inches um, or a tenth of a meter in width and about a meter and a half long. Um, it erupts this 100 kilograms per second through this nozzle. And if you divided this area into, say, seven separate vents, as is likely on Enceladus, each vent would be about a tenth by two tenths of a meter in size, small. The eruption velocity of Old Faithful is about 88 meters a second, 30% higher than the mean particle velocity on Enceladus. Some thermodynamic scaling that takes into account the lower gravity of Enceladus and the massive depressurization of eruption into a vacuum shows that Old Faithful, which rises a mere 30 to 40 meters on Earth, would do just fine to provide the plume on Enceladus. The chemistry of the plumes is, however, unlike that of any geothermal plume that I'm aware of on the Earth. A very gassy terrestrial geyser contains only a fraction of a percent of non-condensable gas, usually carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide or hydrogen sulfide. Although water vapor dominates the plume of Enceladus, it contains a huge amount of non-condensable gases, up to 9 or 10 percent um, mole, mole fraction. And these are a combination of carbon dioxide, maybe nitrogen or methane, and recently discovered uh, ammonia. Ice particles with some sodium chloride have been observed in the E-ring of Saturn and are presumed to have come from the plumes. The ice particles have been classified into three types. Type 1, pure ice. Type 2, ice with organic or siliceous material. And these two types of ice are sodium-free. Type 3 ices comprise a half to 2% of the ice mass and contain traces of sodium salts. Thermal observations of the surface of Enceladus have shown a total radiated power that's now up to 18 gigawatts and hot, hot spots reaching 167 Kelvin in temperature. The thermal anomaly is not symmetric, namely round or square, but is rectangular or oval, elongated parallel to the tiger stripes. The thermal anomaly is not a thin line restricted to the tiger stripe valleys, but is a broad feature extending perhaps five kilometers on either side of the tiger stripes. There are also warm zones perpendicular to the tiger stripes at both ends. Careful pointing of the spacecraft and detailed analysis shows that the hot spots mostly coincide with the proposed vents, as shown by the yellow stars on the right side of this slide. Enceladus has a rich array of geologic provenances, and they are remarkably symmetric relative to the spin axis and to the Saturn and anti-Saturn directions. There are fractured planes on both the leading and trailing hemispheres. There are heavy, heavily cratered planes that wrap over the Saturn-facing side across the North Pole and down the anti-Saturn side. And it's convenient to refer to this terrain as a craton. Any interpretation of processes that have occurred or are occurring now must preserve this ancient and heavily cratered terrain, which I'm going to simply refer to as the craton for now. And that really means lumping a lot of past geologic history into one simple word. Um, the focus and controversy over the past three years has been on the south polar terrain, that area south of about 45 latitude. This terrain is remarkably devoid of impact craters and probably has only a few that are larger than a kilometer in diameter. This has been taken to indicate that the terrain is less than 500,000 years old. 
And this terrain can be simplified into four major regions, which I'm going to come back to in the context of a model for the stress field in the South Polar region. The innermost uh, region is that of the tiger stripe terrain. The surface, surface expression here is of four mutually parallel, evenly spaced, 130 kilometer long fractures, which have been interpreted as tensile fractures, perhaps with a component of right lateral shear. They're about 35 kilometers apart, and each tiger stripe is about half a kilometer deep and about two kilometers wide. The longitudinal axes are oriented about 45 west. This terrain coincides with a thermal anomaly. And the anomaly was defined by Spencer et al. to be the area inside the 77 Kelvin isotherm, shown as the red line on this image. Note that this area is not symmetric, but is rather elongated in the direction of the long tiger stripes, a component of the stress model that I'll talk about. The second um, tectonic region is a narrow annular band at about 60 south that surrounds the tiger stripe terrain. It contains modest topography and no salient tectonic features. The third terrain is a ring of ridges. The ridges are best developed on the parts of the ring that run approximately parallel to this tiger stripes and the longer sides of the tiger stripe terrain, another observation that's to be tested by the models. The outer terrain consists of at least three tensile radial rifts that propagate northward toward and even beyond the equator like the arms of a starfish. Where these radial rifts emanate from the ring of ridges, the ridges appear to have been pushed into the openings of the rifts, much like fold belts are pushed into the openings of allocogens on the Earth. There are two antithetical models for the source of the plumes. One group of models allows liquid water at depth, with boiling of the water driving the plume and entraining the observed ice particles. These models are variously referred to as cold faithful models. Another model has no liquid water at depth, and the plume is driven by degassing and sublimation, and this model is dubbed the frigid faithful model. These two antithetical models arose largely because of the different assumptions about the role of non-condensable gases. The cold faithful models assume a single component H2O system and examine the implications for reservoir characteristics and plume dynamics. The frigid faithful models assume a multi-component H2O gas system and examine the implications of this system for reservoir characteristics and plume dynamics. So let me review the liquid water models first. In a single component H2O system, there are two possibilities for a reservoir to produce an ice-laden plume. Boiling with the entrainment of liquid drops that freeze to ice particles, and sublimation with subsequent recondensation to provide the ice particles. In the seminal paper of Porco et al., the argument was made that the ratio of ice to vapor in the plume was so large that thermodynamics precluded the sublimation recondensation model. A correction of errors in that paper brought this ratio down to a value that is easily consistent with the sublimation recondensation model. And if these low values hold, then sublimation recondensation in a single component system is precluded. As I understand the abstracts, Andy Ingersoll's talk following mine is presenting another recalculation that shows that this mass ratio is high. And if this is true, the sublimation in a single component system can be ruled out unless additional processes such as the entrainment of ice particles from the walls are invoked. As new observations have come in, the ideas and complexity of the old faithful models have changed fairly dramatically, generally progressing from left to right in this figure. On the left, model A is a variation of the original 2006 cold faithful geyser model in which boiling of a very shallow salty water entrains droplets that freeze to provide the mass loading. This process should carry large amounts of sodium and salt rich ice into space. Since the observed abundance of NaCl is sparse, this model seems unlikely. Model B has a salty ocean at depth with water evaporating slowly in a narrow fissure. Vapor escapes to the surface to form the plume and ice particles would be generating from the freezing of salty droplets entrained in the flow. This model fails in the same way as model A because the ice particles are not salt rich in general. In model D, liquid water results from melting of near surface salt poor ice by a process such as uh, tidal friction or frictional heating along faults. The water is slightly salty from NaCl in the crust, collects in a reservoir and could boil to produce lightly salty grains entrained in the vapor. This model may be a possibility but has not been highly developed. <clears throat> 
Model E is the most highly developed of these models and has been dubbed the Mystic Caverns model. In this model, a large body of salty water in contact with a rocky core evaporates into a pressurized chamber. Water vapor and ice particles, including salty particles generated by dispersion above a salty liquid, escape to the surface. This model explains low sodium water vapor and salty particles. It also addresses the question of high vent velocities for the vapor. In this model, like all of the liquid water models, the gases come from somewhere else and are not an integral part of either the reservoir picture or the plume dynamics. Well, we pointed out in 2006 that the abundances of CO2, CH4, or, um, and carbon monoxide or nitrogen that were reported then exceeded their solubility in liquid water. Recently, Waite et al. have repeated this um, observation and based on the more recent flyby have added C2H2, which is acetylene, and C2H4, ethylene, to the list of non-condensable gases whose abundance exceed their solubilities in liquid water. Gases do not occur in nearly these abundances in terrestrial geyser systems, and yet even small amounts in terrestrial systems, they dominate the plume dynamics on Earth. Single component models ignore important aspects of the multi-component, multi-phase thermodynamics and fluid dynamics. There is an alternative to the liquid water model based on a multi-component system that accounts for the role of the observed non-condensable gases. In this model, the gases are all stored in cages of ice, a structure called a hydrator clathrate. This slide illustrates a methane molecule in an ice cage. In this model, decompression of the clathrates releases the gases and ice particles. And as these gases ascend, water vapor is added from sublimating ice. This became the antithetical frigid faithful model. Now I'd like to point out that the frigid faithful model is not the middle one that's shown there, which shows um, solid state sublimation alone, picking up uh, salty grains from uh, a layer in the crust. Rather, the frigid faithful model should be portrayed something like this, as solid state degassing plus sublimation. And in this model, restrictions such as the ice vapor ratio that apply to a single component water system do not apply in this system. Clathrates are garbage bins for storing gases. One test of the frigid faithful model has been that as new compounds have been discovered in the gases of the plume, all of them, including ammonia, and can be stored in a clathrate structure. In the original paper, we suggested that the reservoir of the plumes consisted of clathrates or clathrates plus water ice, and we didn't include sodium chloride hydrate um, because sodium chloride was conspicuously absent. In light of the discovery of sodium chloride, we'd amend this now to say clathrates plus ice plus ammonia and sodium chloride hydrates. Well, based on the observations of the gases and the phase relations, we suggested that an ice-capped, icy clathrate reservoir was episodically and frequently ruptured by fractures, which is illustrated schematically in part A of this slide. As long as the icy crust contains only minor leaks, the confining pressure is maintained and the clathrate remains stable. Small leaks will tend to be self-sealing because any water vapor produced at depth freezes in the cold ice cap. In the dynamic stress environment of Enceladus, fractures will repeatedly expose clathrate reservoirs to near vacuum conditions as shown in parts B, C, and D of this slide. Large fluxes of gas release are inevitable, accompanied by massive ejection of ice grains, shown by the stars in the figure. If the total pressure drops below the vapor pressure of the ice particles or the ice walls, sublimation occurs to yield water vapor. We suggested that this process produces jets of gas and ice particles in the fractures comparable to jets produced by comets. Clathrate decomposition into a vacuum is self-sustaining because vapor is the stable phase, but it is simultaneously self-limiting because the decomposition is endothermic. In smaller fractures, condensation may lead to rapid self-sealing, as in A, 
But in larger fractures such as those shown in B, C, and D, condensation may be limited to boundary layers at the walls. Condensation is accompanied by the delivery of latent heat to the walls. Eventually the conduit will seal shut and the process may start up again in the same vent or at other places. The process is time variable due to the complex geometries of fractures that are possible and the time variability of the processes that open and close the fractures such as tidal stresses. In order to quantify the nature of the plume dynamics further, we needed to formulate a model of what the crust might look like and we did this by an analysis of the tectonic structures of the South Pole. So we came to these ideas by trying to figure out a simple model for the origin, and I stress origin, not operation, of the south polar terrain. No one doubted or doubts that there is a source of heat in the crust, although the process of heat production, dimensions of the heat source, and nature of the heat transport have been topics of controversy. We formulated the simplest possible model we could think of for the origin of the south polar terrain, a heat source in the crust resulting in thermal expansion of the crust. Our goal was to see if a simple model could produce the stress field consistent with the four major regions of the south polar terrain that were shown on the, on the slide um, and that I went through as part of the uh, geology of the south polar terrain. We also assume that the thermal anomaly on the surface is a mapping of the heat source that is buried uh, under the tiger stripe terrain, that it is rectangular or oval in shape as defined by the 77 Kelvin isotherm. In order to model the evolution of the south polar terrain, we assumed that the original crust of Enceladus could be modeled as an elastic half space with a uniform Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. The source of heat is modeled as a part of the shell that differs from the rest of the shell only in its temperature. This source of heat is surrounded by the crust of the tiger stripe terrain. Using classic structural geology relations, we assume that the uniform crust extends to a depth that is reflected in the spacing of the tiger stripes, about 35 kilometers. And for lack of any other obvious constraint, we took the thickness of the heat source to also be 35 kilometers. And that's really the one variable in this model, or parameter, I guess you'd call it. And this turns out actually to be consistent with some of the recent tidal heat, heating calculations that put the zone of maximum heating in the mid-region of the crust. The source of heat expands driven by the temperature contrast, but the expansion is constrained by the surrounding material, the craton of Enceladus, leading to the development of stresses. To compute these stresses, we use the mathematical solution for a center of dilatation in an elastic half space as a Green's function. One of the results is that the temperature difference that drives this process can be as small as 4 to 40 Kelvin. Well, this simple model predicts a stress regime that is entirely consistent with the observed terrains. Oops, I should have figured, oh yeah. Um, directly above the source of heat, which is at zero on this, the hoop and radial stresses are both tensile, which is at the top of the red arrow, allowing the formation of a set of fractures, the tiger stripes, which is the bottom of this red arrow. If the heat source were symmetric, the fractures could have any orientation. But if the heat source is elongated, there is a preferred direction parallel to the direction of elongation because of the relation of the stresses along the two axes of different length. At a distance of about 100 kilometers from the pole, out here with the orange arrow, the, the radial stresses vanish, which is where the zero, and the hoop stresses take on moderately tensile values. Thus, adjacent to the tiger stripe terrain, the model predicts that there's a relatively unstressed narrow annular region shown by the orange arrow on the bottom. That mo this region may show modest topography and no salient feature, tectonic features. And this is in accord with the observations that around 60 south, there is a relatively featureless zone surrounding the tiger stripe terrain. At further distances from the pole, the radial stresses are compressive, as shown by the blue arrow here and the hoop stresses are tensile. Driven by the compressive radial stresses, which peak at a distance about 140 kilometers from the pole in the model, a ring of ridges about 280 kilometers in diameter forms around the tiger stripe terrain. And driven by both the tensile hoop stresses, which act as tearing agents, and the compressive radial stresses, which act as splitting agents, as shown in green, a set of radial rifts may open up 
north of the ring of ridges. The radial rifts propagate for very long distance in the radial direction, crossing the equator. And there is an argument in the paper, the PNAS paper, that these rifts extend through the entire crust. If this is so, we reason that there should be about eight of these big rifts. And at the time, there were three observed in the half space that was imaged. Um, the real geology uh, actually complicates things, but we felt three in a half space was good agreement. And we also predicted that because of changes in the stress field after the tiger stripes were formed, that the rifts would be most prominent perpendicular to the tiger stripes, shown as the bigger ones here, uh, and least developed parallel to them, which is in agreement with the observations. Well, what do the fractures look like in a brittle elastic model? In the insert of part D of this model, we show a schematic of the structure of fractures in brittle materials like ice or cement, for example. A fracture is not a single cut, but consists of a slice of finite width crisscrossed by multiple subparallel cracks. Thus, fractures in brittle materials are surrounded by a microfractured region that's termed a crazed region. You can see crazing on the glaze of a teacup, um, the very fine cracking in the glaze. But in ice, it's more subtle. And in fact, it takes instruments to actually document the extent, uh, remote sensing instruments to document the extent, because the fracturing and deformation isn't easily visible. And we proposed in this paper that the width of the craze region is likely to be about the width of the troughs, about two kilometers near the surface, and to increase in width deeper in the crust, so that the crust consists of a heavily cracked matrix of fractures of all different scales. That's shown schematically in, in this um, 3D illustration. So our picture of the crust then is one in which an icy clathrate mix is pervasively fractured on an ongoing basis by tidal stresses, releasing gases that ascend through the fracture networks. The pervasive fractures allow advection of gases through, throughout the whole crust. Well, what happens when a fracture opens up in ice? Experiments show that vapor and ice particles are released explosively. The ejected particles are of micron size. And in experiments of unconfined ice under uniaxial stress, jets of particles are ejected at velocities up to a kilometer a second. It's been proposed that this process occurs on Ganymede, Europa, and Enceladus. Quantifying the effect is difficult because the conditions of failure depend on the thickness of the sample as well as the stress field. And so scaling from laboratory samples that are 0.4 millimeters in thickness up to crustal thicknesses of 100 kilometers is a difficult task. Um, this process cannot happen above 250 Kelvin because plasticity um, takes over as the deformation. The red line that I drew in here schematically shows the effect of size on the instability. And there's been some work done to try to predict this theoretically. This, this um, explosive ice transition appears to be related to several of the ice polymorph phase changes and may occur because of bond weakening. The ratio of ice particles to vapor produced by these decompressions is about 1,000 to 1. And so it's a way to generate high ratios of ice to vapor in frigid, in frigid Enceladus, frigid faithful kinds of models. The frigid faithful model is an advective heat transfer model. And we emphasize that heat transport is not along thermal profiles determined by the thermal conductivity of ice, but rather by advection of vapor and redistribution of latent heats. In advective heat transfer, heat is absorbed as the latent heat of vaporization of ice or decomposition of clathrate is redeposited near the surface as latent heat of condensation. In such a model, the crust remains cold and frigid because heat transfer by advection dominates and leaves little to be accounted for by thermal conduction through the solid crust. So here's how we, um, sorry, let me. Here's how we think the system works thermodynamically. Clathrates decompose in an icy clathrate reservoir, which is number one. And we, we can't assign any depths to these because we don't have a fluid flow model. This is a thermodynamic analysis, not a fluid dynamic analysis. The primary product of this decomposition of clathrates are the non-condensable gases and the shredded ice particles. The gases released diffuse through small cracks in the icy crust toward larger fractures, such as number two. 
This diffusion process is known as throttling in terrestrial geothermal systems and is modeled and is an isenthalpic process, constant enthalpy, and for perfect gases, it's isothermal. When the gases get into the fractures, they rapidly accelerate initially, say, from two to three. This process can be modeled as isentropic, constant entropy. At some point, heat transfer from the walls or from the entrained ice causes the expansion to become non-isentropic, say, between regions three and four. Gases flowing with heat transfer are modeled as polytropic expansion processes. At a point like number four, the gas pressure has dropped to that of the local sublimation conditions, and so sublimation can occur, say, between regions four and five. As sublimation occurs, the relative abundance of water to gas increases. During expansion from four to five, the mixed gases expand polytropically, but the water vapor is constrained by the vapor pressure curve. We envision that the major conduits to the surface are actively subliming and depositing in a complex way because the water vapor component is constrained by the sublimation vapor pressure curve. This is indicated in the sketch by the uh, alternating bare walls and blobs of deposited ice in the major conduit. In particular, in fractures close to the surface, the main process of deposition, the main process is deposition, indicated in region seven here. In kimberlite eruption dynamics, uh, structures like this occur where the kimberlite material, the ascending kimberlite material from the uh, lower crust um, doesn't make it to the surface. And these are called blind diatremes. So I put that term on there. Whoa, I guess I leaned on the wrong thing. Um, from, in these shallow zones, thermal conductivity then transfers the latent heat of condensation up to the surface where it's radiated, um, where, sorry, where it's radiated away. The mixed gases, however, don't attach to the walls unless they happen to be trapped during ice deposition, and their partial pressure continues to decrease as does their relative abundance. At some point between five and six, the equilibrium processes cease, and both the gas and water vapor expand isentropically. Well, we, I show one case that we've been working with here of a quantitative analysis of these processes, and they're on a pressure temperature phase diagram. So as an example, we took a clathrate reservoir. This thing's erratic. Okay, we took a clathrate reservoir initially at 250 Kelvin. The gases are released from the reservoir following an isenthalpic. This is really frustrating. Following an isenthalpic decompression path from one to two. Um, and this is isothermal for perfect gases. Upon entering bigger fractures, the gases initially expand isentropically, say from two to three, and then polytropically from three to four. At point number four, the gas pressure equals the local sublimation pressure and temperature, and sublimation begins. The water vapor component then follows the saturation curve from B to C, whereas the gases continue to de decompress polytropically. This is the mechanism that allows for the reversal in molar abundance and partial pressures of the gas and water components between the reservoir and the surface. The scale of the advection process is quite impressive. The heat map indicates that the thermal anomaly extends out to about five kilometers on each side of the tiger stripes. And we take that as the horizontal scale of the near surface fracture zones and blind diatremes. The latent heat of condensation is about 2,800 2, kilogram, kilojoules per kilogram, and 6,000 kilograms per second would be needed to produce 18 gigawatts of radiated power. This is the equivalent of vaporizing six cubic meters of water per second. And six cubic meters is actually a cylinder my height and sort of out to my elbows. So uh, you'd basically be vaporizing a, a fairly small volume of solid ice, but it sounds like a lot. Uh, and this is distributed over all of the active tiger stripes. <clears throat> 
and, and the uh, 6,000 kilograms per second is what's needed to produce the 18 gigawatts of radiated power. The vapor travels up the conduit to zone four and five, and a few hundred kilograms escapes into the plume, indicating that 5,800 kilograms per second is redeposited in the near surface fractures. Well, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts to ponder and perhaps for discussion. The first one is one of the more profound pieces of wisdom that Gene Shoemaker imparted to me when I was a beginning grad student thinking about explosive kimberlite eruptions. And this was four words, up, up, and away. Gene firmly believed that if you have a leaky system, it's extremely difficult to contain the volatiles. And I'd like to just tell anecdotally about how I realized how really difficult this was. I did most of my initial field work on geysers in Yellowstone, in which the a geyser like Old Faithful is really predominantly water. There may be a little non-condensable gas in Old Faithful, but my thoughts were all anchored in the H2O phase diagram. And then I went to New Zealand and worked at a geothermal power plant for three months and learned what happens when you have geysers full of non-condensable gases, which is what the New Zealand geysers are like. Um, this makes it extremely hard to, to uh, process the water for geothermal applications. And it also makes it extremely dangerous because if you cap off a geothermal well that has carbon dioxide in it and don't let it leak, it will explode because of the carbon dioxide pressure that builds up as the gas exhausts. And so this was a, a real lesson. There, there actually are craters in New Zealand that are hundreds of meters across that are blowouts from geothermal wells that exploded. And the second thought I'd like to offer is a quote from the uh, end of the Joy et al. PNAS paper. A frigid, stiff, and thoroughly solid Enceladus may elicit fewer hopes of finding extraterrestrial life than a cold, creeping Enceladus with liquid water close to the surface, but it is consistent with observations and perhaps more compatible with what might be surmised of a minuscule icy moon. And then finally, a quote by Ralph Lorenz, which was applied to Triton and I think is, is applicable to Enceladus. One must not equate a cold, low-energy environment with an absence of energetic phenomena. So thank you, and we'll have time for questions, which Bruce requested. <laughs> this thing is on. There's two of it's off, and it's there. We're going to get it fixed after you've gone. Questions? Yeah, thanks. John. Okay, you said a couple questions. Are they going to come one at a time? Well, yeah. Uh, 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 how would you get the sodium into the flat rate? How would I what? How would you get the sodium into the flat rate in the first place? So, so okay. Uh, and that's a nice thing about the particular model is that it's naturally easy to get sodium into the source region if you have it in the bottom. So, how would you do it in the flat Okay. The first question. Oh, the first question is, why do we show uh, temperatures of 250 Kelvin um, in our source region? We can make this model work probably down to about 220 at, at the least, thermodynamically, and, and account for the gases and the um, water vapor and the constraint that the continuity uh, that mass continuity puts on vent dimensions. Uh, below that, it's, it's actually hard to get it to work. So I'm not, um, in some ways, I don't like the 250 Kelvin in terms of the brittle fracture model because ice starts getting soft. But we realize that, you know, they're probably, I mean, the world's much more complicated than a brittle elastic half space. Um, and the second question was, how do I get the sodium chloride into the crust? Um, and that's not part of the modeling we do, but um, and I'm hoping maybe Zolotov will talk about this later, but the general um, models for, for, for the formation of salt into the, into the crust or in pockets rely on uh, thermal interactions between the crust and the core. And whether these are occurring um, 
now or in the past is a question actually that Dennis Matson has brought up. And, and you're really making assumptions. I think Dennis said in the paper, they assume these reactions are occurring in the present. We assume they occurred in the past. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's hard to see because there's a big bright spotlight there. Oh boy, um, I can't pretend. <laughs> I can't pretend to, to uh, answer that. Fortunately, I don't have no. I didn't even take high school biology, so um, I'm not going to speculate at all. Um, my, I, I have tried to look up whether each gas forms clathrates as it's been discovered, and I think all of those do. Uh, and could be stored in the crust. Now, whether there, the, there's a paper, I think later on the the photocatalytic um, reactions, but I, I really couldn't pretend to address it. I did remind me, I for, the, the question of life, I, f I forgot to show my last slide, um, which is this bison in Yellowstone. And I imagine Enceladus actually to have the, the tiger stripes to be filled with this haze of, of material that's sort of like the geothermal haze in Yellowstone. So maybe since I don't know biology very well, I could even point to that as a candidate for life on Enceladus. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I just, I really can't pretend to do the, the bio, biochemistry. Andy. Yeah, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way, no wonder. We, we chose, um, I can't read this from here, but the two last arrows, um, CD and 4-5, I guess it is, are chosen as freezing in the flow to have the right ratio. It, it really depends. If you wanted to say, no, the process doesn't freeze until you get down to 180 Kelvin, for example, you, you'd get a different ratio. And I'm not sure, I mean, both, even though the n nature of the gases has changed from one observation to another, the general relation between 90% and 10%, 90% uh, water and 10% gases has held. Um, Yeah, and I, I think that that ratio may be time variable. Uh, I wish we had a whole lot more observations. Go ahead, Annie. 
Okay, the question is, uh, is about this uh, mass ratio of, of uh, particles to, to a vapor, which is a strong constraint in a single component model, water. It's not a constraint in this model, and in fact, uh, one of the possibilities, depending on where this explosive fracturing process takes place in the conduit, you almost end up with too much mass, but you can always invoke that it falls back. One of the things we've started doing is looking at the um, schmidt brilliantov papers on um, the collision mean-free paths. And I don't think that it's proper to apply that model sensu stricto for a mixed component system, but if you do, which we've done, um, you, collision, if you let the collision paths go up to 10, a few meters to 10 meters, uh, that's consistent with reservoirs down to 220 Kelvin in the mixed, in the mixed gas model. Uh, if you restrict it to one meter or a tenth of a meter, which was the original analysis, then you're stuck by that with the higher temperatures, 250. I, has it been going on? Well, the mass calculations um, looking at the depression, the topography, uh, give hundreds of thousands of years. Um, a recent paper apparently at um, the DPS meeting by Stan Peel suggested that this basin is a big meteorite impact crater that happened 100,000 years ago or something. And in some ways, that's an intriguing concept, but it's always the uh, concept of last resort. And if there really are relict tiger-stripe terrains, which it looks like there are, then how many times can you evoke a big meteorite impact it becomes a question. So I, um, there are some papers out actually uh, suggesting that this process is episodic and can shut off. Um, I, I don't do the, the tidal heating models and, and orbital models. Bill McKinnon. Okay, John's um, arguing that you cannot produce 18 gigawatts of energy. Um, and first of all, I should say, models to date really have only worried about six gigawatts, because these new numbers are very new. Right. But your argument is based on basically a solid or lightly faulted uh, Enceladus, that you can't produce that heat. However, in this um, crazed, in this idea of the highly cracked crust, you can produce the decoupling, which is really a delamination, by the, the emergence of the crazed regions like we show. Um, in four proposals that haven't been funded, we've showed preliminary calculations that you can get gigawatts of heat by, you're basically rubbing stacks of cards against each other in our model. So um, I still am not if, if I felt I were forced to accept liquid water by some piece of data, I would. But I don't see, at the, at the level of this overview, I don't see a need um, to have that there. If we tried to implement this deck of cards heating and it didn't work, then yes, I'd have to say there's liquid water. But I think this lamination can occur. Um, 
No, I, I agree. You've got to have. Uh, Yeah, um, okay, the question is, uh, what do I think about the Argonne 40? And, and I thought of putting that in and trying to deal with it, but um, we haven't had a lot of time. That white paper came out, what, June, I think. Um, if the basic argument is that you, I think in the white paper, is that you need the liquid water to facilitate having that much Argonne 40 coming out. Um, at the surface compared to what you would expect from a rocky core. Is that right? Right. Yeah, I actually thought that weight allowed for liquid water or in the relatively recent past liquid water um, in that. And so, um, I, don't, I don't know the Argon 40 story. Yeah, and I, and I pardon? Yeah, um, I think that's something that we have to work on, um, and I, I need to do it. I just didn't have time to develop this model. We're we're trying to get a paper written on what we call the vapor pressure paradox, which is what Andy brought up about how you reverse these, because in the original paper. We talked about sublimation loosely, and we actually thought it was of the snowflakes at, at the ice particles at that time, but um, I think the conduit walls. And we've done some calculations about the total length of uh, faults you'd have to have to make this uh, vapor pressure paradox, to solve the vapor pressure paradox. Um, the argon-40 is, is, is troublesome. Yeah. Dennis Matson. Um, I'm sorry, but I couldn't hear any of that. <laughs> um, Dennis, were you saying you could concentrate the argon-40 in the ice and release it by deformation? Is it? Well, I mean, the fractures are localized. I mean, they don't occur all over. Um, and, and clearly, there's, we think they're sampling a huge area at the bottom, basically the, around through the whole crust, and funneling stuff up into a narrow area. So it's a concentration mechanism. Um, Other questions? John Spencer again. If people talk, I'd really appreciate it, and probably other people would if you talk loud. Um, Dennis Matson, but speak up. Or come up. <laughs> Yeah, well. 
Um, how did it start and how's it going to end? I think that's a, a lifetime project. Uh, the, there is a debate about, in terms of how it started, about whether Enceladus is cometary in composition, and I think that's going to be addressed later. How will it end? In our model, the only thing that ends is when the fracture seal shut and then, poop, they open somewhere else. Um, so we're, we're not trying to model that long-term picture at this point. And I, I would like to point out that I, I showed it on the initial slides, but there's a tremendous review by Spencer et al. and basically the Cassini team uh, in this new book called Saturn After Cassini, I think it is. Pardon? Yeah, it it's really it was helpful for me in preparing the talk. Well, thank you again, Sue. And we will now transition to uh, the rest of the morning, which is remarkably about Enceladus. And I believe Carolyn Porco is going to take over the chair. <laughs>